Thanks, everybody. And uh, welcome to the folks out in internet land. Uh, glad to have you with us in addition to the folks in face to face. So um, my name is not Ron, I'm actually Anne. So just letting you know that we switched here. And I'm gonna kick us off and provide a little bit of background on what, we, what we're planning to talk today, talk about today. So in essence, what we're looking at are a set of profile uh, practices, basically, for how you uh, should manage your authentication from end to end. These, um, we'll, we'll do a little quick introduction on these profiles, these practices, and then we'll hear a case study from Chicago about what they learn in their implementation of these practices and how they're using them. And then we'll give you a little bit of background about how you can learn more. There's a whole community out there working on this. And so if you read through them, you have questions, um, you're looking at strategies for how to better your passwords, this is the place to be. So brief in intro. The, the basic premise behind these uh, practices uh, comes out of the, the uh, identity federation context. So if you think about it, if you're familiar with an in common in identity federation, there's a split, right, between who does the authentication and the identity management portion and who does the actual service providing and the authorization. So the campus, traditionally, right, does the identity providing, uh, issues the credentials, manages the authentication, but it's the service provider that may be a government organization like NIH, or it might be People Admin, for instance, that actually uh, has an, is incurring the risk of that authentication transaction that you're managing on your campus. So the whole profile nature came out of uh, the federal government and HSPD-12. I won't go into all of that, but you may be familiar with um, some of the work they've done at NIST. In essence, what they're looking at and what they've came, come up with is a set of practices in 863. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. Um, so the campus then uh, issues these practices or, or issues these credentials, and the individual then accesses the service provider. But the service provider needs to trust uh, the campuses that they've done due diligence. They need to understand that the risks of their service that they're offering to the campus has been met. But as you can kind of imagine, you know, if I have relatively low risk service, so you're just accessing, for instance, uh, uh, a minimal data set that is, has uh, no PII in it and is freely is shareable to everyone, you may not as a service provider want to require the campus to have uh, a really strict level of security on their authentication the actual uh, implementation and the cost that the campus would have to uh, incur to support your security needs uh, really don't match, right? And so you would have very few identity providers actually accessing your service because it's not cost effective for them to do so. So there's a balance between uh, balancing the risk that a service provider has and the cost and the effort the identity provider has to uh, better their practices uh, to, to address the risk. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in the Incommon Assurance Profiles first, and then we'll go into kind of some of the background and why I think this might be a good thing for you to take a look at. These eight sections really make up the Identity Assurance Profiles. We also have another document that's a framework that, that really describes the trust and how this all fits together, but the profiles are really where the meat is. So as you can see, uh, the basis of trust in identity assurance and federated transaction has a business and policy aspect to it. We have to make sure that the organization first is who they say they are, right, before we even get to the individual. Right. We have to make sure that the registration and identity proofing of the individual is set. Um, we have to make sure that the technology that you use to do your authentication, the actual uh, token, is, um, is, is a good one, the, the pro approach you're using. And then, of course, how you distribute it to the individual is also solid. 
Um, the actual authentication process, the transaction, has to be well thought out. Um, and then a key piece is how do you make sure that the individuals are kept separate in your identity management system and, and manage that relationship? And then the information that you convey about that person to the service provider has to be um, solid as well. And then, of course, your technical environment, how you protect your, uh, your, your network and your systems physically, for instance, is also a component. So as you can see, the authentication process goes from inception, you know, creation of the account um, to the actual, actual um, uh, decommissioning of that credential. So it goes from end to end. I guess you could say, in a way, the authentication lifecycle so you might say, um, well, this is great. These profiles are actually password-based. Why should I really care about these profiles? So um, don't, don't we want to use multi-factor? Uh, and I would say, yeah, I think multi-factor is absolutely the way most folks are going. It makes a ton of sense. But you're going to have passwords around for a while. You won't have a multi-factor probably rolled out to every service and for every individual, possibly for a while. And you need to kind of look at the services and the data you still are protecting with passwords. There may be some really good reasons why you want to do some best practices on how you handle authentication. Also, not every risk that you're dealing with uh, with respect to passwords is phishing, right? And which is what multi-factor tends to, to address. There may be issues like fraud, like issuing the credential to the wrong person, for instance, because you didn't identity proof. So there are other uh, risks that one incurs if you're not looking at the full gamut of, of your authentication service. So what are your choices there? Your choices are you can use stronger credentials where you can, uh, like multi-factor, um, and you can improve the passwords until you no longer need them. So I just want to give you a little bit of background that will hopefully make you feel all nice, warm, and fuzzy, right, about the Encama profiles and where they come from, because you may not know what these are. And um, they really have a quite a substantial provenance um, that is meant to both help you uh, implement and then also uh, ensure that you're doing the right thing. So you probably have heard of the 863 um, e-authentication guidelines. It was written for the federal government by NIST. This is complemented by um, OMB M0404, which is really a risk analysis methodology um, that GSA, that OMB put together. So the, the two uh, for the federal government came out of the HSPD-12 directives that were come out of 9-11, uh, and they were meant to, uh, in essence, um, increase the security and verify the identity and uh, increase the level of security of transactions for federal services federating with each other. Right, so these are federal specs meant for federal agencies. So the U.S. government, though, came out and said, you know, we don't really want to be in the authentication business for things like, uh, um, you know, consumer credentials. The IRS does not want to manage your authentication uh, to their services. They really would like to federate. That is their long-term vision. Um, and so they put together an organization under the CIO Council called the Identity Credentialing and Access Management Subcommittee, FICAM. So the F is federal, something that we non-federal people put into the, to those acronyms, a federal ICAM, federal uh, grouping. So they're, 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 you think of, of what they're doing is an API for trust. So they're taking 863 and saying, we understand this is written for the federal government, right? But we want to put it out there and wrapper it with um, some actual uh, trust framework requirements like verifying business, right? 863 has nothing in there about business and business requirements. It doesn't have much in there about technical um, and facility controls. 
It doesn't have a lot about, in fact, nothing about policy and how often do you renew and verify, for instance, that what you're doing to support their, um, um, their, their requirements is, is still true, is still valid. So, so FICAM put some wrapper around this and then they put it out there, the community, and they said, community, we would like you to apply as trust framework providers and tell us how and develop your spec that is comparable to 863 and we will assess whether it's comparable or not. So in common, of course, you know, be acting on behalf of higher education, because that's, that's our gig, right? We uh, know that higher education has very strong ties to the federal government. Um, we uh, already federate with NIH and NSF on all, over 40 services. Um, and uh, they're a really big, uh, both uh, obviously grant uh, partner as well as a compliance partner for us. So um, we know that the federal government is really key service provider for us. So we said, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's write one of these specs. So we did. We wrote um, the identity, uh, identity assessment, identity assurance assessment framework, which describes our whole uh, uh, framework in terms of how you get approved, defines all the terminology, things like that. And then we wrote a document called the Identity Assurance Profiles, which is equivalent to NIST 863 level one and level two. I should say comparable to, right? So um, we then went through, long story short, um, a full audit of our, um, um, our profiles against the FICAM, FICAM program and came out the other side with a nice stamp of approval. So these practices really are written for higher ed because they are not 863. Those of you who are well versed in that will read it and understand that immediately. Um, they are written with intent, not specific requirements because we didn't want to go through and change and, and really chase the technology development. We wanted to leave it open so that campuses could come to us and say, I really like these requirements, but we're going to do it this way, and here's the risk assessment that we did, and here's why we should be able to do it that way, right? That's called an alternative means. And then uh, we have an assurance um, advisory committee that's made up of service providers, relying parties, and auditors that reviews those. Once those alternative means are accepted, they're added to the spec. So the spec then grows and morphs depending on what the community is interested in doing and what works for you. Now, it has to, it has to obviously comply with the spec, um, but it enables the spec to be more, uh, less rigid and more flexible with respect to implementation, which is what we're trying to get at. So I guess I would end my section before I turn it over, I'm the potatoes, he's the meat, before I turn it over to Ron um, and ask you a question. When you're doing your authentication, you're, you're designing your processes, you're looking at your end to end, what processes and what practices are you using for guidance? If you have a breach and your president comes to you and says, how do I know we've been doing due diligence? You can hold up these practices. They're approved by the federal government. They're written for higher education, for, by higher education, and say, these are the practices we're using. A good thought. So my colleague, Ron Thielen from University of Chicago. Thank you, Ann. Uh, apparently, EDUCAUSE could only afford one lavalier mic, so I'm going to be tethered to the podium. If I wander off and you can't hear me, um, you can feel free to throw something at me. Just, just be aware if I see you dozing off, I might toss it back at you. Um, so while Ann started out at the 50,000 foot level, I'm going to dive down a little bit deeper into actual technical challenges that we faced at the University of Chicago. Uh, hopefully I won't nosedive into the ground, but uh, you can help me there if uh, you see me going way off the rails. Uh, you could also move closer if you feel like it. There are uh, plenty of seats up here. We could actually turn this into a round table if you wanted to, uh, if it weren't for the internet audience. 
Um, so if you were at the 11 o'clock general session this morning, you saw a slide that said compliance is not security. And I want to reinforce that a little bit. And sometimes you implement a control because you want to achieve compliance, and sometimes you do it because you're trying to improve security. Hopefully they're both aimed at the same target, but that's not always the case. Um, but what I have found in working on silver, in common silver compliance at the university for the past five going on six years now, is that um, trying to comply with the standard has led us to see several different ways in which we could improve our security. And I'm going to talk about some of the ones we're working on right now. Um, if you go to in common and you look at the identity assurance assessment framework, which is a lot of words which describes identity assurance and the process and what it's aimed at, doesn't really have the profiles itself. There's a separate document for that. But one of the things that's really useful in the assessment framework is Appendix C defined terms because you have to be familiar with what's the difference between an identity provider and a verifier and the role that uh, different pieces of technology play in your own uh, environment. Uh, so some of the things I'm going to be referring to are the identity provider, which in our case is Shibboleth. It's the thing that actually makes SAML assertions. Uh, the credential store is any place where you're storing the authentication secrets that the identity provider is relying on. And the verifier is the thing which actually verifies that the authentication secrets are correct. So in our case, that's uh, LDAP. In the latest version of the uh, Identity Assurance Framework and Profiles, they introduced a couple of new terms, protected channels and approved algorithms. And these have been the bane of my life for the last two years because the words used to be industry standard, which was a lot easier. <laughs> Industry standard could mean a lot of things. Protected channels refers to approved algorithms. Approved algorithms has a very specific meaning. And uh, there's a little bit of leeway in that in common could approve an alternative means, as Anne alluded to, alternative means, which satisfies the approved algorithm requirements. But they haven't done that yet. So you really have to fall back on what uh, NIST uh, says is an approved algorithm. And this is talking about hashing and encryption algorithms. Now, why, why do these terms cause us problems? Well, one is that uh, uh, if you look at the NIST documentation, you'll see that, uh, for example, SSL version 3 is no longer, no longer adequate. You have to move to TLS. So we have to change our services to use TLS. So we need to use approved algorithms and protected channels for things like the web page where users manage their accounts, the web page the identity management staff uses to manage the services, uh, sysadmins SSHing into the servers and the identity management systems have to be using uh, appropriate algorithms to protect their SSH sessions. The Java libraries that we use to support some web services in our environment needed to be upgraded. Um, Shibboleth and Grouper required some changes. And mostly it was just a lot of grunt work to do. Um, there's one aspect to this, which I'll talk about towards the end, that um, we're not going to exactly fix, but we're not exactly required to either, and I'll explain why. Um, the biggest area where protected channels and approved algorithms has caused us headaches is in Active Directory. Um, so Internet 2 and in common and uh, before that the CIC uh, has uh, had a couple different iterations of working groups uh, looking at the issues in Active Directory and supporting the in common silver standard and what the implications are because we pretty much all have active directory in our in our environments and there are issues we just finished a reiteration of the uh, active directory silver cookbook i worked on both the first version and the second version it's taken us a couple years well, it took us a full year to get this new version out because 
Uh, there was a lot of parsing of the spec that we had to do, uh, and finding information can be difficult. So even though NIST says these are the approved algorithms thou shalt use for encryption, finding out from Microsoft what algorithms they actually use at different parts of, uh, of their domain controller and Active Directory architectures was very difficult. Even though we had Microsoft on the calls with us sometimes, it still was difficult prying out the exact information about, well, where is RC4 used versus SHA-1 versus AES versus whatever. Um, so when you go to look at the AD Silver Cookbook, and I encourage you to take your time digesting it and understand how it fits to your environment. So this is the um, slightly modified identity management functional model. Uh, you can find the original in the assurance framework document, but we modified it just a little bit to include the box in the lower right-hand corner that says Active Directory Verifier. So let me explain what that means. Active Directory in our environment is not the verifier that Shibboleth uses. Shibboleth is the IDP, the identity provider there. That's a key piece. It uses LDAP as its verifier. The issue for us is Active Directory is still a verifier, and Active Directory has the same authentication secrets that the IDP relies on because everybody in our environment has one network ID and password that they use regardless of whether it's LDAP or Active Directory-based authentication. So that means you have to understand in your environment the role that Active Directory plays. Is it a ver verifier or is it the verifier for the IDP? Because different requirements in the profile may apply differently depending upon how you answer that question. Some universities actually have separate credentials. So your Shibboleth user ID and password may be different from your Active Directory identity. In that case, a lot I'm going to say, what I'm going to talk about may be off the table for you. A lot of this, though, have moved in the direction of single user ID and password for everything. So if we look at Active Directory, these are the challenges that we faced. Our LM compatibility level was set to four. And what that means is that even though according to the documentation, NTLM v2 is preferred, NTLM v1 is still accepted. And while I say according to the documentation, that's because you would think that if a client could do both and one was preferred, that's the one it would use. It turns out that's not always the case. Sometimes clients get lazy and just use the first one that works. So even if the client uses NTLM or supports NTLM v2, it may wind up using NTLM v1. I'll explain why that's bad in a minute. Um, I found, looking at NetFlow is going to the domain controllers, I was surprised to see that there was a lot of uh, traffic that was not going over SSL. And when I looked at it further, I found that it's not signed, so it's not encrypted. And so there are LDAP binds. Even though we have an LDAP service, Active Directory, of course, presents, the domain controllers pre present an LDAP service as well. And some clients are perfectly happy to send their credentials to Active Directory as an LDAP service completely unencrypted. So you may have user IDs and passwords flowing over the wire in clear text in that case. If you look at the cookbook, and I'll explain the details of why this is later, um, one of the recommendations the cookbook makes is that you may want to look at something like BitLocker for your domain controllers because there is a requirement that you encrypt the password store, the credential store. In our environment, we can't use BitLocker. It's not supported under VMware, and most of our domain controllers are virtualized. So those are our current AD challenges in dealing with Incom and Silver. And are they compliance or security issues? Well, what I've been telling the users mostly to try and convince them that we need to do the work to solve these problems is that these are not compliance issues. These are security issues. 
They're, they were brought to light by our compliance effort, but the fact that you have user IDs and passwords flowing over the wire in clear text, that's certainly it's a compliance issue, but it's more of a security issue, and we would want to solve it regardless of whether we were trying to comply with Incom and Sober. So our response so far has been a combination of technical controls and one or more alternative means statements. So again, that phrase alternative means, and if you're if you're more, say, familiar with the audit world, if you're kind of an ISACA kind of person, you might think of an alternative means statement as a compensating control. So I'm not going to go through all the profile requirements because we only have an hour. Um, but I'm going to look at uh, th or two in particular that affected us. So. Uh, one that uh, the AD Silver Cookbook Working Groups have spent a lot of time working on is 4236, which says that you have to protect the authentication secrets. Now there's a 42362, which is specific about authentication secrets used by the IDP. And in our case, since the AD credentials are the same as your LDAP credentials, even though AD isn't the IDP, they're the same authentication secrets. Um, if, they're, if those credentials are sent between services, they, those services have to use protected channels. And again, that implies they have to use the NIST FIPS approved encryption algorithms for that, um, with an exception, which I'll, I'll propose later. Um, and the, the other one which hits us is that if non-IDP apps um, use them, then you have to proceed, uh, have policies and procedures in place to minimize the risk of their exposure. So where this comes into play, and I'll talk about this, is if, for example, you've got a web page that uses form-based authentication, that's a non-IDP app, probably. It's maybe just some random student government run application on your campus that decided they wanted to use LDAP to authenticate the users. And then in that case, they don't need to use protected channels, but you have to have some sort of a policy or practice in place to mitigate the risk of them doing things wrong and shooting themselves in the foot and exposing your passwords. Um, so how do these apply specifically to the Active Directory, NTLM v1, and unsigned LDAP bind issues that face us? Um, well, as I said, because we still accept NTLM v1, uh, but NTLM v1 isn't actually passing the password. NTLM v1 is actually passing an NT hash that's encrypted with the password, so who cares? Well, it turns out that for $34, you can run that NTLM hash through something like CloudCracker and then run the result of that through CloudCracker. And then so after your two runs, you get the password back. <laughs> okay. So even though NTLM v1 credentials are not your password, they're just a step away from your password. So uh, given how weak the credentials are, again, it's a security issue, not a compliance issue. So our first thought was, well, let's turn our shields up. Let's go to LM compatibility level five and just stop accepting NTLM v1. Turns out that that may not be possible, or at least as easily possible as we may have thought, for one very particular reason, and that's radius. So MSCHAP v2 is the phrase used in the literature is cryptographically equivalent to NTLM v1. Just, just say it's NTLM v1, okay? And EAP MVS CHAP2 v2 is fairly ubiquitous. Um, if you use Edgerome or support Edgerome, you have to deal with these issues. Um, EAP PEEP TLS supports or protects, actually creates a protected channel between the client and the RADIUS server. So you're good there. Even though you're using NTLM v1, it's flowing over a protected channel. 
the problem is if your Radius server is one of the, those that has implemented uh, some of its authentication using the Samba code, um, then between the Radius server and the domain controller, your MTLM v1 or MSChap v2 credentials are flowing over the wire again. Okay. So this, this diagram from freeradius.org illustrates exactly our situation in that we're okay up until we get to the Radius controller. And since we are using Free Radius on our campus, along with a couple others um, for historic reasons, um, we do send NTLM uh, to the domain controllers. And so what are we going to do about that? Well, one solution is to get away from using EPEEP and use ETLS so that instead of using the CHAP v2 credentials, you're actually relying on certificates issued to clients, but that means you have to do client man certificate management for all the devices on campus connecting to wireless. And that's not going to happen in my lifetime, or at least certainly not before I retire. Uh, another option would be to move off of free radius and move to something like uh, Win uh, Microsoft's NPAS on Windows, and then the credentials aren't flowing over the wire. Uh, and um, Microsoft has done some little tricks to make sure that uh, um, if you go this route, you're not exposing your credentials in that way. Another option would be to actually create protected channels before, between all your radius servers and domain controllers. And this is the route that we think we're going on. So you could do something like create IPsec tunnels between all the radius controllers and the domain controllers. And that's what I thought we were going to do until the Windows administrators got cold feet because we've got a big cluster of radius servers and we've got a dozen or more domain controllers, and they just thought that it was getting way too complex. Um, another option, and this is my opinion, but I think if you created something like a private backnet between them, it wouldn't technically meet the definition of protected channel, but I suspect, based on the conversations I've had, that if I submitted an alternative means statement to common saying, hey, we, we call this a protected channel because it's a non-routable VLAN, uh, complete, non-addressable in any way. Uh, it's basically a, a private backnet. And hey, if you really required me to, I could do it at layer one. Um, that would be as good as a protected channel based on encryption. Uh, another option we're looking at is to use radius proxies and actually putting radius proxies on the domain controllers themselves and then using something like RADSEC to create TLS tunnels between the radius serving the wireless infrastructure and the radius proxies sitting on the domain controllers. So we actually haven't picked the approach that we're going to take for this yet. Um, I think it'll be one of the latter two. We're still assessing it. Uh, the other thing that you have to do then, though, is what I call monitor and mitigate. If you're going to leave NTLM v1 on, you may have to put in some other control to deal with the fact that your domain controllers are still accepting NTLM v1 credentials. So this is a case where not everything can be fixed with a technical control, and there could be lots of reasons for that. So. We're going to implement uh, the monitor and mitigate strategy, which we've documented and submitted to in common. And if you go to the Internet 2 uh, community pages for insurance, you'll see some statements up there describing monitor and mitigate. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here about how that works. So for NTLM v1, uh, a logon event is generated, and that Logon event, if it's an NTLM logon, has a field which tells you which version it is. Um, I recommend that you filter these events because in our case, 98% of them are for anonymous. It turns out anytime somebody goes to an IIS web server anonymously, even though they're not doing any authentication, it says, oops, I got an anonymous logon. And so it generates an event which is completely useless and meaningless. So. You can save yourself a lot of traffic and storage cost if you just filter those out. 
Um, also, I found that all these radius authentications don't generate 4624 events. So apparently, they're not considered logons. They're, they're merely authentication. So uh, they weren't showing up in any of my logging. So what we did do is we created some PowerShell scripts that filter the events, write them to flat files on a file share. Um, I'm probably going to be replacing the PowerShell scripts with an X-log. Uh, if you're familiar with that, I'm finding that to be a better tool for this sort of thing. But I, I'm not somebody who likes to dictate to people how they should do their jobs. So I said to the Windows admins, here's a problem. Tell me how you want to solve it. They came back with the PowerShell scripts. I said, okay, great, go do that. Now we're a year down the road with this. I'm going to go back to them and say, okay, let's look at this NX log thing because I think it's better for a lot of different reasons and I'm going to be doing some education around that. Uh, so it writes out an, uh, an event and here's a sample. It tells you the domain controller where it happened and the user and what domain they were authenticating to and what system they were on and what the IP address for that system is. So then we have a Perl script which once a day goes through all those log files, creates some reports based on what it finds, what it finds. If it finds a user showed up in one of those events and that user was a valid in common silver user, then we take away silver from that person and we create a help desk ticket saying to the help desk, you got to go help this person because they did something bad on the network. They did something that generated an NTLM v1 logon. That exposed their credentials in an unacceptable way, so we had to turn off silver. Um, in the long run, I don't think this is scalable, um, but it's good enough for us for now. What happens is if they can't figure out how to help the user, the user then goes and gets silver uh, re-enabled for themselves, and then they just wind up losing it again a week later. Um, so we have to actually fix the underlying causes. So as I say here, this might be good enough for compliance. I think it'll be good enough for our achieving silver, but it doesn't really solve the underlying security problem in that we still have NTLM v1 credentials flying over the network. We don't have a lot of them, fortunately. We, it's, it's a, I, I think in our case, we will eventually be able to get to uh, a better technical control for this. Um, but for now, the next step is go fix the problem at the source. So go talk to the user, find out what they did, what system, we know what system they were using, find out what it is about that system that causes it to use NTLM v1, and then fix it to use something else. Second problem with credentials going over the network in the clear with Active Directory is LDAP binds in the clear. So by default, Active Directory is perfectly happy to provide LDAP services and take binds in the clear. Um, there are some things that you can do to fix this. You can turn on LDAP signing, which it turns out also encrypts the payload. Uh, you can require LDAP to use SSL or TLS, so basically only use LDAPS. Or you can do IPsec for everyone, which again is like putting certificates on all the, all the mobile clients. It's not something we're going to do. Um, requiring LDAPS is likely a non-starter because some schools have found that that adversely impacts your Windows clients. And hey, if you're going to configure your domain controllers so that your Windows clients are impacted, sort of what's the point? Um, Active Directory is there for your Windows environment. Uh, however, if you turn on LDAP data signing, your Windows clients won't be affected. They're happy to deal with that. But it's likely to break some non-Windows clients, so Macs and Samba may have issues. And you then have to go mitigate those. So just like uh, with the NTLM v1 events, if you're using Windows Server 2008 or later, you can turn on an event 2889, uh, which says very verbosely, the following client performed a SAS whole bind. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, what we did again is the, we have the PowerShell scripts go through, filter those, reduce that verbose event to the facts that we want, and write it out to a log file. 
And then the same Perl script that handles the NTLM v1 events actually handles these events as well in the same way. And again, this may be good for compliance, but doesn't solve the underlying security problem that you've got passwords going across the network in the clear. So somebody still has to go talk to the client and find out what was it that you did that caused this to happen. And we've found a few common scenarios, but there are some that we still haven't been able to resolve. So for example, Microsoft Office on the Macintosh by default loves to do these unsigned binds to L, uh, Active Directory as an LDAP service when it's doing lookups for people. Um, you can go in and you can change it to do it securely, but it's not the default. Um, other circumstances, we've had cases where um, people generated uh, an unsigned LDAP bind we went and talked to them. We tried to dig through the logs. We never were able to figure out what it was that caused the problem. In that case, at least in one infamous, infamous case in my office, we told the user, look, you, you don't need silver right now, actually. There, there's no use case for it in your case. So until we figure out what the problem is, just leave things as they are, and we'll work on it. A week later, he went back, reasserted silver, and then lost it promptly and got quite upset because he did something we told him not to do. But I think we all deal with situations like that, too. Um, the other uh, profile requirement I'm going to talk about uh, much more briefly is the one that says that if you're storing authentication secrets, then they need to be secured. And it, there are three ways the requirement gives you to secure them. And again, in our case, remember, these are not, these authentication secrets are not the authentication secrets um, LDAP, I mean, our IDP is using, or LDAP is using directly, but they are the same authentication secrets those services use because we have one user ID and one password for everything. So the NT password store needs to protect these authentication secrets either by storing them using a salted hash, encrypting them using an, improve, an approved algorithm, or protecting them using something approved by NIST level of assurance three or four, which none of us is going to do. Um, we, we tend not to be protecting the nuclear arsenal, so level of assurance four is not where any of us are really aimed. The problem is Active Directory does none of these by default. It doesn't salt the hash, it just stores the hash. The algorithms that they use to do the encryption uh, are not approved. And so your Active Directory store um, cannot meet this requirement if you want to do silver. Uh, so the AD Silver Cookbook recommends that you use some other third-party technology to encrypt the password store. And the example we provide in the cookbook is BitLocker because it's free, it's there. Um, and, and BitLocker will use an approved algorithm as it turns out. I think BitLocker will use AES as its algorithm for doing the encryption. Problem in my case is that BitLocker is not supported under VMware and most of our domain controllers are virtualized. Um, now, there are other encryption solutions out there, but we haven't vetted any of them yet. So if we were to go down the route of getting a third-party encryption product that was uh, aimed at VMware vDisks, um, there would be an adoption speed bump for us. So we're going to try a different approach. And that is we're going to create an alternative mean statement based on our threat risk analysis of what this whole requirement is trying to address. So for example, uh, we're on, on the domain controllers themselves, we're whitelisting applications uh, so that if there were a breach, uh, it would be very, well, it would be, let, let me just say, it would be much more difficult for somebody to exfiltrate data by introducing tools uh, which weren't native to the platform and already whitelisted. Um, 
we have physical media management controls. So if the requirement to encrypt the, the store is there because you're afraid that a hard drive is going to walk out, well, for one thing, these are virtual drives. Uh, so they're spread out all over the storage infrastructure. Um, but we have physical media management controls that we've already been audited against for FISMA compliance. So I think that that uh, circumstance would be uh, covered in a federally accepted way. Um, we do use multi-factor authentication uh, for administrative access to uh, all the Windows servers in our data center and uh, we use Bastion hosts. Um, we use, we rely heavily on NetFlow analysis. Um, so we've got alarms specifically set up looking at the traffic on the domain controllers. And basically we're doing anything that we can think of to mitigate against uh, data exfiltration from the domain controllers. So we'll see if that gets accepted as an alternative means statement. Um, but I was an English major for a while, so you know, creative writing is in my background and uh, I think I can manage it. Um, now the last, well, yeah, the last thing that I'm going to talk about, this is not an Active Directory issue, but this goes back to the requirement that you have to protect the authentication secrets on the wire, so it's similar to the NTLMv1 issue. But it's the 42363 requirement that says that you have to have policies and procedures to minimize risk of exposing those credentials to non-IDP applications. So the IDP being the identity provider, the IDPO being the identity provisioning office. The things under our direct control all use protected algorithm or protected channels and approved algorithms, but there's lots of things out on the campus that could be using the same verifier. So we're locked down, but on our campus, anybody can use LDAP as an authentication service. So that means that even though we encourage the use of Shibboleth, uh, there's still lots of forms-based web pages on campus where people are entering in their network ID and their password to get into some application that is not centrally administered. I mentioned student government a few minutes ago. Uh, you know, as I said, anybody on campus can put up an application and use our authentication service. Now, because we've locked down the LDAP service itself, the communications between their web server and our LDAP server are secure. On the other hand, we have no way of knowing in advance that they've done the right things on their web server, like configuring it to use SSL on the page where users are putting in their user IDs and passwords. Um, so what we've done is we've created some scripts that go through the LDAP logs and identify all the addresses where our binds are coming in from. We look at those addresses, try and figure out what kinds of services might be running, what kind of ports are open. Then we crawl over those addresses to look and see if we can find web pages where users are entering in user IDs and passwords. And if we find any that are not using SSL, we create a ticket and then somebody has a conversation with the, whoever's responsible for that machine to try and motivate them to fix the problem. Motivation meaning if you don't get it fixed within a reasonable time frame, we'll actually block you from the network. Um, so that's it for the, we went from the 50,000 foot level down to about the two foot level. Uh, so there's quite a, a wide range there. Does anybody have any questions uh, about what we presented or assurance in general? Um, any questions from the internet? Hi. I see. Okay. Um, I have a question, and that is, do you? Uh, how do you go about 
um, designating this person or that person as meeting a certain level of assurance as defined by, you know, in commons, bronze and silver statuses um, or profiles. You said that you were able to revoke an individual's silver status. This, do you just award that by default and then remove it when somebody, you know, does something they're not supposed to? Or do people specifically apply for this? Or how is that all managed? So the the 50,000 foot question is uh, not everybody necessarily needs to have a level of assurance or even the same level of assurance. It depends on what services they need to access and what the service provider is going to require. The way we've done that on our campus is, and I didn't go into the business process aspects of all this. I went right into the technical because I knew that there were a lot of technical people in the audience. Um, when we first started down this road, my belief was that the business process aspects were going to be the most difficult. The, the questions are out, how do you actually verify that this person who says they're Ron Thielen is Ron Thielen? And there are requirements spelled out for ways to do that, but actually implementing the business processes to do that can be quite tricky. So in our case, if somebody feels that they need in common silver, and I'll talk about that in a second, then they actually have to show up in person to our identity and privileges office and prove that they are who they say they are. They also have to register a non-university electronic address. So you have to have an address of record, electronic address of record, so that we can contact you in case there is some security related event that's a, that affects your ability to have your silver assertions. Um, once you do that, and then once you meet the password entropy requirements, um, so you have to have changed your password within the past year, um, that sort of thing, then we actually have a page where it shows you as you progress through meeting all those requirements, you get a little green check mark, and then when you get all the little green check marks at the end, you now could get silver assertions made on your behalf. How that's all handled under the cover is through a bunch of grouper groups. And so what we do when we take away silver from somebody is we just put them in a grouper group that says silver denied because they failed the AD audit. Okay. And then once their problem is resolved, they get taken out of that, uh, that group. They then have to go change their password because it got exposed and then they automatically get their silver back. Now in the case I talked about where I said to that user, you don't need silver, <laughs> it was literally because they weren't using any services that required them to have silver. They were just doing it because they wanted to be good citizens and they thought that going through the silver process would be useful to them. And eventually it will be, but until I can figure out what the heck his Macintosh is doing to make him lose silver, on a regular basis, there really isn't any point for him. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I was just going to say that um, a number of campuses are, um, have addressed this problem. I, I think um, Penn State in particular uh, developed a central person registry and it's actually available, it's an open source um, that, that uh, tracks assurance as part of that. So it's, um, they do it in their central person registry and I think have seven or eight different fields uh, under each entry that um, make sure that, you know, addresses all the, the specific requirements they have for that individual. Because not only does the organization get, as you, as you know, you know, uh, certified, but then each individual, right, it's a transactional uh, thing that's expressed using authentic context at SAML, using in, uh, a SAML to authentic context assertion um, to at that point in time is that individual bronze or silver. So um, what Ron is doing is exactly what needs to be done, and that is, you know, if a, if a person does something that compromises their silver credential, it needs to be, you know, removed and then. Uh, re-elevated again when the silver um, um, issues are addressed. Yep, just, yep. Just one follow-up. Oh, can you do it with the microphone, please, yeah. so we have the, the off? 
Does, does that drop that person down to a lower level, like to bronze, or do they lose any kind of assertion at that point? It, it probably depends on the campus and what their policies are, but, but yeah, a lot of times uh, it can be, um, it could be bronze. I think it probably depends on the breach and the, the issue, too. Right. We actually, we've been concentrating on silver because for us we think that's where the value is. We'll, we'll worry about bronze later. Once we get silver, do, we think doing bronze will be pretty easy for us. Mm -hmm. um, but in cases like that, we're going to have to think through whether they should be dropped down to bronze or, or have all their assertion capability removed. And it will depend on the nature of right. the issue that caused them to lose silver. So if you go through the profile, you'll see some things are highlighted as being bronze requirements. Some things are highlighted as being silver requirements. So if the thing that they do highlights a, or violates a silver requirement, but not a bronze requirement, then theoretically we could just drop them down to bronze. But that will require a lot more logic on our end, I think. So you mentioned uh, the thought of having two authentication stores to isolate these primarily Microsoft issues two different authentications, one for silver and then the other for the NTLM v1 requirement. Did you just rule that out because of convenience? Was there just too large of a community that to that would you'd be juggling the two credentials? I'd say there were two things. Uh, uh, the latter is the primary in that. There, we just decided that in our case the community is too large for us to go to the extent of setting up a whole new credential system for them just to deal with this issue. And the, and the other one is that um, we have a senior director uh, who really believes strongly that this should be possible and that if we can do this and show people best practices and how to accomplish this, it'll be good for the entire community. And so it's sort of my mission statement to go forth and show that this can actually be done. Hard problem syndrome. Yep. If That's we right. can solve the hard problem, then you don't have to. That's right. And I guess uh, in, in keeping with that, I wanted to point you at the, the questions and answers slides here that goes over uh, basically the, the community that's out there to, to help you implement these. And I think they're valuable, even if you're not interested in, in common assurance and getting certified, using them to in, inform your authentication service. As you can see from, from Ron's uh, in-depth discussion, it really helps you shine a light on those cobwebby little corners that you don't normally look in. Uh, and you kind of assume that it's all working, and then when you kind of do a deep dive, it helps you do that. So I think um, I, I think even if you're not interested in common assurance, it's a it's a helpful thing. And as I mentioned, it helps with the due diligence. But there is a group out there. We have an entire wiki uh, devoted to helping folks deploy this. Um, the AD Assurance Cookbook. We did a webinar actually today at 11 o'clock. And that will be put up there on that wiki also, uh, talking about what the AD Assurance Cookbook is about, what are the, the major components of it, and so forth. And you can take a look at that. We also have um, a case study from Virginia Tech. Uh, they are bronze and silver certified, and they put all their information out there. Um, in terms of the NTL MV1, uh, we had a chat with Brian Arkills, and he's going to be doing a presentation uh, on that, um, getting rid of NTL NTLM v1 at University of Washington and his, his adventures in doing that. So he's going to be sharing that also with the assurance community. So this is, this is basic security stuff, folks. So um, it would be great to have you join us. And um, thank you very much for coming. Right. So we've been given the hook. Yes. And if you've got any other questions, here's our contact information. Feel free to shoot an email to us. Thanks for coming. Thank you.